Hi, I'm Ryan Kohlenbeck from Seekin Vehicles. Today we're down at Sector 111, we'll be continuing our educational series. Uh, today discussing some of the characteristics of superchargers relative to their output and how they impact the vehicle. So what we're, we're going to do today is try to stick to the high level and introduce you to some of the characteristics that you know, engineers use to help size these systems, as well as some of the outputs and basic equations that govern them. The ideal scenario when you're doing this kind of analysis is to do it completely based on the laws of physics and you know, basic equations that govern those. So the, the issue with that is, is you need to know an awful lot about the devices involved in this analysis, the engine, the supercharger, the turbocharger, whatever you're looking into. Uh, if you're an OEM, you have the ability to do that because you're about to spend an enormous amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, to create an engine or create an engine family that will then use these devices. So the reward of a good analysis program dramatically outweighs the cost. But in the aftermarket, where the volume is lower and you're not going to create a device, you're using an off-the-shelf one, it makes much more sense to do a quick estimation and then test on an engine dyno or chassis dyno in the vehicle. So because of that, the OEMs use a physics approach, which is based on the amount of fuel you can get into the chamber, which then if you mix with the correct amount of air, you get the right amount of pressure, which creates the right amount of force, and you get the, and then force over time is power. Um, from an aftermarket perspective, you don't have anywhere near enough knowledge to be able to do that kind of uh, analysis. So you stick to, if I made this amount of power and I increase the airflow this amount, then I should be able to get that amount of power out, this new amount. And that works to an extent, except you're making an awful large assumption that the combustion process is not affected by that increase in the air, which if you get lucky or depending on the engine uh, and its hardware that you have available could be a reasonable assumption or it could be a horrible assumption. Uh, and that's where use of these models has to be done appropriately. So some of the characteristics of the two models, the OEM one will be based on combustion dynamics. It'll take into account the brake mean effects of it effective pressure in the cylinder, which is the force pushing down on the piston. Uh, it'll take into account the, the brake-specific fuel consumption, or BSFC, which is a measure of uh, the, flow of, the flow of fuel versus the power output. And uh, you can take into account the energy in the fuel, because sometimes we run gasoline, we run E85, um, run diesel in certain applications, and you have to take all of that into account. And then beyond that, you get into the engine operating parameters, the camshafts, valve timing, uh, the air fuel ratio changes, spark advance, all of that kind of stuff, and then the durability considerations that come out of you know, what's the air temperatures, the exhaust gas temperatures, things like that. The aftermarket model is based much more along if I have this, you know, there's a baseline in power, and if I increase the manifold pressure, I'm going to get a certain amount of power out. And again, that's a large assumption based on uh, lack of input, lack of fidelity, if you will, uh, on the combustion process. So. If you can instrument an engine up enough, you can get that information. It's just a matter of is that cost worth it versus simply going out and testing. So some of these equations are either just a definition of a term or a physics-based reaction to, like for instance, the compression of air, uh, while others are making an assumption that the combustion dynamics stay the same, and if I add this amount of air, I'm going to get some out. So things like temperature rise, density ratio, pressure ratio, supercharger speed based on pulley, those are all straightforward calculations that will be accurate on any engine. But the output power or the airflow estimation is very much an engine specific thing. And especially with a cam phased engine, you can affect those dramatically based on cam timing, you know, cam lift, things of that nature. So you really have to know when to use these equations uh, at the right time to be able to try to get some form of accuracy out of your outputs. On the screen right now is a screenshot of a quick, a quick and dirty Excel calculator that I use to do basic estimation with six or seven equations that uh, help, help me anyway to understand what the outputs of a supercharger are going to be on an engine. You know, again, there's, there's, there's assumptions built into a couple of these and then other ones like the temperature rise due to compression, that's just simple physics. If I compress a fluid a certain amount and I know it's uh, the, how much temperature gain it gets based on that compression, I'll know the output temperature. So. The suppliers of the power adder devices, superchargers, turbochargers, will provide these various maps to engineers to help them understand the characteristics of that device. So the first of the maps is, that we typically look at is the adiabatic compressor efficiency map, which is 
basically trying to show you how good the device is at compressing air relative to what the ideal gas law says it should be able to do. Because there is no, no device is perfect, so the question is how close to perfect can you get? Uh, the second piece of the puzzle is because superchargers, especially root superchargers, are positive displacement devices, meaning they try to put out a given amount of air per revolution, they're also not perfect at that. So they have what they call a volumetric efficiency plot of the compressor, where if it was supposed to put out one liter of air per revolution and it's 90% efficient, that means it actually puts out 0.9 liters of air per revolution. Um, that's, and all of these characteristics are affected by how much boost you're trying to make on the other side and how fast you spin them. The final one that we have to take a look at is the drive power loss curve, or the, which is basically the mechanical cost of the supercharger. How much energy does it take to spin the supercharger? So a part of that is the, the energy required for the compression, and a part of that is overcoming bearings and drag losses within the supercharger. So, and from all of these maps, you get a few outputs. You get the compressor efficiency, which we talked about earlier, the volumetric efficiency, the drive power, and then an idea of the RPM at which the supercharger needs to spin in order to achieve these metrics. So, we're going to walk through the first, flip through a couple of these maps real quick, just to give you a sense of what they look like. The first one here, this is the compressors, uh, the adiabatic efficiency map uh, for the MP62 uh, from Eaton. This is what they publish on their website. So most folks have seen these before, or uh, if not, they're relatively available on the internet. Here's the same map for the TVS 1320, again from Eaton's website. So on your screen right now is another way to show the same basic information. This is a plot of the adiabatic compressor efficiency for an MP62, uh, just shown in a different way. And the little blue lines going across the screen are actually the drive power losses of that same supercharger. They've plotted more than one thing on this this chart. So from this one chart here, if you happen to have it, you can actually pull off supercharger RPM, the compressor efficiency, and the drive power loss associated with a given flow rate and pressure ratio. Uh, pressure ratio, again, is a, is a fancy way of talking about the amount of boost that the supercharger is making. But it's measured based on the, uh, the supercharger's effect. So the the air in front of the supercharger and the air out of the supercharger. If you have an intercooler or a restrictive induction uh, that change those two parameters, it has to be measured at the supercharger, not at the engine or at the air filter. So on your screen right now is a, another plot of, for the M62, which is the volumetric efficiency of the supercharger. Basically, again, this is a measure of how close to the ideal amount of air coming out per revolution you actually get. So the thing to take away from plots like these are the faster you spin the supercharger, the better off it is from a volumetric efficiency, as well as the lower the pressure you're trying to make, the less amount of boost, the better the volumetric efficiency will be. Uh, it's, it just has to do with, as you increase pressure, it's pushing back against the supercharger, it's harder to flow that air. And as you spin it faster, there's less time exposed between the the, the gaps between the rotors and the case and things of that nature that allow for leak paths. So spinning it faster removes the leak paths and reducing the boost kind of allows the supercharger to flow air easier. It's an easy way to remember that stuff. So. Finally, sometimes you get data presented to you just in the form of numbers and you have to plot your own curves. And on the screen right now is the, these are the input power curves, the drive loss curves for the 1320 uh, based on some data from Eaton. And what we've got plotted here is just a couple of different boost levels or pressure ratios and versus the supercharger's RPM, and it shows the drive losses of them. So all of these maps taken together are what you, do, what you use to start pulling some of these characteristics out that you can then use in the equations we briefly introduced earlier to try to get an idea of what's going on in, in the engine system. Uh, we'll use all of this information to do an estimation of power, uh, understand how much heat the supercharger is making, which gives a sense of whether or not we're going to have knock problems inside of the engine or how big an intercooler needs to be, for instance. Uh, as well as the, the drive power loss gives us an understanding of you know, how big the pulley needs to be and the associated belt that comes with it because it's got to be able to handle that, that power load through it. 